this week on the Back Table Podcast. So building a culture of wellness is challenging, but there are certainly things you can do. And I think that's one of the reasons I started the podcast was to try and build a culture that it's okay to talk about these things, first of all, right? Especially in surgery, there's a stigma that you should be tough. And, you know, for lack of a better term, we should be that, that classic masculine form, whether you're a, a woman or a man, right? But you should be stoic and you should not wear your emotions on your sleeve. But I think that that's wrong. We should be talking about these things. These are important components of who we are and how we interact with each other. So the first thing is, you're right. You need to speak to other people around it. And if you don't have people in your institution, then there are certainly people around the country and around the world who would be willing to, to speak to you. I'm willing to talk to anybody who, who hears this and, and feels like they're, they're struggling and there are definitely uh, other professionals out there who can do that. I would say in most institutions, depending on the size of them now, the administration realizes the importance of this. The costs of burnout and losing a physician or a surgeon and recruiting somebody else have brought this to the forefront. And so they are very aware and most large institutions now will have at least wellness initiatives or a wellness officer or some program where you can reach out and you can seek help if you need it. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology and endovascular today. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your co-host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest, Phil Piorazio at the University of Pennsylvania, and also to have Aaron Fritz from Dallas, Texas, co-founder for Backtable, joining us as well. Welcome to the show, Phil. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Great to see you, Ditya, Aaron. Wonderful to be here. Great to have you, Phil. Uh, Aditya, thanks for having me as a co-host. Looking forward to uh, getting this episode out on, on both the uh, urology show as well as our end of Oscar show. Fantastic. So, you know, we're really excited to have Phil for a variety of reasons, um, which we'll get into here momentarily. Phil has launched a podcast called Operating with Zen to help physicians think about, learn about, introspect on some of the things that face us, including personal wellness and burnout. And maybe we'll just jump right into it, Phil. What was the impetus for, for the podcast? Yeah, so I think, you know, everybody's got their COVID silver lining. And this was one of the kind of things that came out of COVID for me. And I remember very early on, March, April last year, just having a lot of time to reflect and think about who I was, what I wanted to be, where was my career going? How was I interacting with my patients and my family and my colleagues? And simply, this is a really simple way. One of the things I recognize is I wanted to be more flexible and I wanted to feel better in the operating room. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to pick up yoga. I hadn't done it in like 10 years and I've got a lot of time at home now. And let's, let me investigate a little bit of yoga. And so I started doing yoga with just the idea of being more flexible and feeling better, you know, maybe building some core strength and just being the kind of person I am I wanted to say, all right, well, why is this work and what are the other benefits of yoga? So I started reading into it and I started reading a lot because once again, a lot of us had some free time. And so then I started getting into mindfulness. And as you know, yoga is not just a physical practice, but there's a mindfulness practice in, in yoga too. And so I started really reading into then the science of mindfulness. And I was like, wow, this is really applicable to what we do in medicine and something that is really, truly missing. And so I started kind of putting together my thoughts on how we could integrate a mindful approach to life into surgery, into medicine, just to generate well-being, to prevent things like burnout and depression and all of the anxiety issues that many of us were facing prior to COVID that have just been amplified. And then I started the podcast as a way literally to just collate my thoughts. And with the idea being, I want to put my thoughts down in a way that makes sense to me. And if this helps anyone else out there, if this helps one person or two people or three people, amazing. This is something we need to start talking about in medicine, something we need to start talking about in surgery. And if we can help, if I can help others out there, then, or at least just lower the stigma about talking about these things, then, uh, then I think, you know, I, I've achieved something and, uh, I've been happily surprised. It's, it's been pretty popular. That's great, Phil. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of touch base on, on some of the things I think that you mentioned. And 
interestingly and coincidentally, um, Phil and I both changed positions over the last several months. And as I reflected on that, it was an interesting experience to do at the five-year mark in my career. I loved my job. I loved my practice. I, I really considered it my livelihood. And it wasn't, you know, just a job, but it actually took knowing that I was going to leave that scenario to reflect on how many people's lives I've touched, how many people have touched my lives, the unbelievable relationships with colleagues, staff, patients. And I actually felt really, really good in a different way about what I'd been doing for the five years previously. And I just never spent the time to actually sit and reflect personally, professionally, socially, you know, what had gone on for the last little bit of my life and what did I like and what did I hope to maybe adjust moving forward? Did you have any similar type of experience as you, you know, you'd been at Hopkins for, I guess, what, 10, 15 years at, at the least? Including training, uh, I was there for 14 years mm -hmm. and I know uh, exactly uh, that experience. And, you know, I just want to make two comments about it. The first, that that's, that's really, it's a reward of what we do right? Being able to touch people's lives, to touch their families' lives. And, and I, that's one of the reasons I'm a cancer surgeon. I think that interaction with people and with their families is one of the greatest interactions you can have as a human being. And, and I think that's what gives me true joy in what I do. But the second thing is, I, I think it, to bring it back to mindfulness a little bit, you became incredibly present in the moment, right? When you transitioned and you started realizing in that moment, what brought you joy, what, you know, what, came behind you and what the future brought. And I, I think that in medicine, we get so caught up in what we do, particularly in surgery. We're so focused on case number one today, followed by case number two, followed by what's going on the rest of the week, that we forget to be in the moment and take the moments to enjoy what we're doing. And the reason we do what we do is because we love it. And it gives us tremendous satisfaction in addition to helping people. And so we can bring more presence into our daily lives and spend time reflecting and thinking on what we're doing we can have a better day, have a better week, and I think get more fulfillment out of what we do. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's somewhat surprising to me, and I think this is also highly present on the IR endovascular side as well, that these are specialties that are among the highest rates of physician burnout, physician discontent. And, you know, in, as you've kind of jumped into this topic, Phil, you know, what are the, what are the, the kind of trends or how does this kind of start? I mean, you, you come out initially and you're enthusiastic, you want to get busy, you want to start having your patients and then somehow something start evolving, changing. Um, can you just kind of walk us through any insight you have on the process, red flags that, that you've noticed or in, maybe reflected on in your own career? Yeah, I think anytime you talk to somebody about burnout, it almost always comes down to a seminal event. They woke up one day or something happened in either a patient experience or a interaction with another physician, or you snapped in the ER and yelled at somebody, something all of a sudden happened that made you go, man, I am burned out. I am at my wits end. I'm not getting joy from what I'm doing. I am not uh, acting in my, in my best manner. And you know, this is not who I am. And then you start thinking back and you go, well, this isn't the first time this happened. I've been doing this on and off for years. And I had, I had that experience. I know others who had that experience. And I look back and I basically can, re can think back all the way through residency, cycling through periods of burnout and wellness. And at that point in surgical training at a very kind of classically surgical training hospital like Hopkins, that was expected. That's who you were, right? That was, that was the badge of honor. Oh man, you've been up for three days straight. Oh, wow. That's incredible. You, you know, if you're, if you're only taking call Q2 or Q3, you're missing out on a good number of cases, right? I mean, that, how many of us heard that when we were training, which is complete BS, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, you can be a much more efficient learner and get much more out of it if you, if you're awake, but you know, <laughs> we kind of, and we had role models that were really uh, not role models for well being, right? working long hours, not typically great family lives, you know, were incredibly academic or productive clinical people, but weren't necessarily a role model for life. And I think that's changing. And we've all come to recognize that you can be a great person and a great surgeon and a great physician 
and that we should be fostering the development of all of these areas of our lives, not just, you know, one aspect or another. So do you see opposition like, you know, cause a lot of these older guys are still around, especially in academic departments. What, what do you kind of response do you get with when we talk about wellness and, and burnout with, with these guys, are, are they just kind of shrugging it off? Or are they coming around and realizing, oh yeah, we are seeing this. I, I think it really depends on, on the person and truly introspective, intelligent people come around and realize what they went through, uh, was tough. And honestly, probably a lot tougher than what we went through. And if you look at what some of the, the senior people in our departments w went through when they were training, it was deplorable. I mean, some of the stuff that, that they experienced. And you could certainly see how that could influence and shape who they are now. And, you know, I think some of them sit there and go, well, listen, I walked uphill through snow to school, both, you know, going to and coming back from school. So you should do it too. Yeah. Uh, that's what gives you character. But I think the truly introspective people say, well, you know what? I went through this. It made me who I am. It wasn't necessarily right. And there's a better way we can do it for you. And I think that's part of what I try to impart to people is that we all go through struggles. Life is struggle, but your struggles don't need to be somebody else's struggles. They're going through their own individual struggles and we can help each other to be better. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. And, um, you know, when I reflect back on my training, some of the things that seemed like so outlandish at that, at that point that I would never, you know, consider doing them now. And it wasn't always a malignant, explicit instruction coming from the top. It was like a culture that was, this is the way it's always been done. And I actually think that at least among the younger generations, trainees, things are coming out at a very different level. And it's brought wellness, personal well-being, work-life harmony, balance, however you want to phrase it, much more to the front where I would say that, you know, in my experience, it's almost becoming unacceptable to be one of the old school, tyrannical, you're going to get reamed out, you're going to be in trouble, um, you're expected to really put yourself squarely on the back burner for the good of your profession. I don't know if you have any th thoughts about that, Phil. Yeah, I think you, you bring up a couple of really good points and, and there, there's the culture and there's the specifics that you experience, right? And I saw really wonderful people do terrible things. Saw somebody smash pager against the wall. You've seen people berate medical students, colleagues, nurses. I sent a lot of apology emails as a resident and junior faculty member for behavioral things. Uh, I'm not proud of them. Uh, I'm, I'm not proud of that at all, but I'll also tell you towards the culture, I was never really reprimanded for any of that stuff early on. I was told to send the apology, right? I, I was, you know, told the right thing to, to the right way. To, this is not the right way to behave. You need to act better, but it was acceptable in some ways, right? Oh, you're a surgeon, you're a surgical resident. That's, you know, uh, it was, I was never really taught the right way to behave, I guess is the other way to put it. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an experience that I think we've all had. And once again, I don't think other people need to have that to be successful surgeons. So I think, you know, it's, it's a well-recognized problem issue in, in our field. And I think it permeates surgical fields. It permeates, um, and medical fields, private practice, academics, hybrids. And, you know, I don't think that we're going to, you know, say, here's a list of seven things that you can do and your life's going to be well starting tomorrow, but. I'd like to just bring up a couple of things that I think are worthy of, of, you know, exploring a little bit further. So one of the things that I think has happened in our service oriented field is that there's an expectation, a need, a desire to be constantly available, whether that's with Epic, MyChart, SecureChat, patients having cell phone numbers, that this isn't 30 years ago where you know, there was a landline and if you couldn't be reached by the landline, somebody else kind of handled things. So maybe we just talk a little bit about, you know, how do we carve out time for ourselves, you know, and our families just, just one-on-one. Yeah, it's, it, it's great. And I love talking about this practical stuff too. I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that creating boundaries is going to limit what you can do. You have to change the framework on that. Creating boundaries actually enhances what you can do. 
right? And it keeps you focused and it keeps you in line. And what I mean by setting boundaries is set expectations for your patients and your colleagues. So for instance, I started this new job at the University of Pennsylvania and I have a fairly reasonably sized administrative role to my job. And to all my colleagues, I basically said at the beginning, listen, I am available to you guys 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you need me, you call me or text me and I'm here in my role to kind of facilitate this division at this hospital. But email is a non-urgent form of communication. Do not expect me to answer my email after work hours. If I happen to send you an email, I don't expect you to respond to it or answer to it until normal work hours because that's non-urgent communication, right? And so that's just one example of how you can set boundaries for your colleagues. And with your patients, you can do very similar things. Listen, nine to five, or if you're operating that day, seven to five, seven to six, when I'm in the hospital, when I'm taking care of patients, I am all yours. You call me, I'm there for you. But don't expect necessarily a, uh, that I'm going to be available to you at two o'clock in the morning. Now, obviously there's an emergency, there's channels set up at every single hospital, whether it's a resident or a colleague, somebody else on call. And the two most common misconceptions that a lot of physicians have is I'm the only one who can take care of this patient, or I'm the only one who can do this. And that's not true. You, your colleagues are amazing. Your, we train residents and fellows so that they can handle these things and learn how to do them. And I will tell you, there are very few complications or issues that one of your colleagues cannot handle. And guess what? If they can't handle it, they have your information. They can reach you. And that very rare circumstance, once every few years in the middle of the night where they actually need you because they can't temporize the issue or help you. So we've got to get over the, the misconception that we're the only ones who can do this. We've got to learn to rely on each other to work on teams. And by working together and protecting each other, setting boundaries and understanding them, I think that's one of the ways we can uh, preserve wellness. I think that's great advice, Phil. Um, I actually heard that there are some Fortune 500 companies that are starting to do that where they shut off their employees' emails overnight so that they're not working endlessly into the night and they're refreshed the next day. And it's in, improved, it's been shown to improve productivity. So I think that's, I think that's solid advice for physicians as well. Yeah, I tried to, I tried, there's a function on Outlook where you can send emails into an outbox rather than actually delivering them. And then yeah. you can set them out at six in the morning or seven in the morning or nine in the morning, whenever the workday starts, it ends up being a little bit burdensome. But if somebody wants to come up with that line of code or that app, I think that would be uh, very appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also think that a lot of what you said resonates. I had a, we had kind of a family event a couple of years ago and I just needed to, without any notice, take care of my family. And, um, it was a good reminder that the world will turn. And, you know, of course my partners and my chair and everybody were absolutely amazing. And then of course, you know, moving again, it's like you, you have these patients that you have these relationships, you have these roles and you're such a integral part of your outfit. But at the end of the day, patients will get taken care of. There's amazing people and, um, and the world will continue to turn, you know, and, and I mean, we're not all replaceable. I don't want to reduce this to that, but you know, there are redundancies and for the other 99.8% of the things that we do, there's somebody else that could likely do it just as well. So I think some humility actually in all of this that like, like you mentioned, other people are perfectly capable and their heart's in the right place and they're going to do a good job is, uh, is, is valuable. So I, I think, you know, even to me in a new role, a lot of what you were saying is like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. And just setting the expectation versus I just need to start out and be like available every second of every day to every person is probably healthy. So let me ask you like in a, a sentence or two, and I know this isn't easy. You know, what does wellness mean to you? Wow. Sentence or two, huh? This is going to be a <laughs> or, or maybe like a short paragraph. <laughs> yeah. I think in its most practical sense, you know, wellness is waking up and getting through your day every day, feeling well, you know, feeling happy. You're not having pain. You're not struggling. And there can be physical wellness, there can be mental and emotional wellness, right? There's lots of aspects to, to wellness, but it's basically getting through your day without anxiety, angst, or pain. Was that concise enough? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to add on to that, but maybe even enjoying what you do. You know, certainly in Eastern philosophies, and we kind of grew up this way, is that it's your livelihood. It's not your job. Your job has a connotation of... I mean, you know, especially when you talk about professional wellness and of course there's family and all of that, but you know, it's, it's your livelihood, what actually makes you happy, what makes you lively, not 
what you're waiting to be over. And, um, you know, I think as physicians, we are incredibly lucky to be involved in, you know, other people's well-being and wellness. And, you know, how do you, how do you kind of bring this to the top of mind? So you reflect on that, think about that, you know, you and I have just had career changes and it was a natural disruption that forced that upon us. But, um, I mean, do you schedule it in Fridays at nine o'clock? I spend 35 minutes thinking about the positives of being a doctor. Yeah, I think there's lots of ways to do this. And I think the biggest tip is that every individual is going to have their own way to achieve this. And you've really got to find what that means for you. But there are certainly components and you can break down the components objectively. I think the easiest one is physical well-being, right? So if you feel well, that makes, you know, your day easier. So for me, that's daily yoga, that is uh, intense workouts two to four times a week to get my cardiovascular and strength training up. That's what makes me feel good on a daily basis. You know, one of my biggest things, is, you know, when you're younger, you want to get in the gym and you want to look big and strong and you're close to fit cool and, you know, everybody to check you out. Now you just want to feel well, right? In the operating room, you want to do a long day in the operating room or taking care of patients. You don't want your back to hurt. You don't want your feet to hurt. You don't want your hamstrings to be pulling on your pelvis, right? So there, I think physical well-being is the first component. And then I think the, the other part of it is kind of your mental well-being and then your emotional well-being, which are related, but unrelated. And I think emotional well-being has to do with kind of well-roundedness, feeling grounded, having support structures. And for physicians, the mental well-being is actually pretty easily identified, I think. This is purpose. This is what we do. You brought that up before, right? This is livelihood. This is what gives you, what makes you feel lively. We all are in medicine because we want to care for people. We want to make them better. We want to make their families better. We want to build on personal interactions. So we have a purpose. And I think while we are beat down by so many things in medicine, whether it's electronic health records or increasing burdens, we also, as, a, as opposed to some other professions, have the easiest way out in focusing on our purpose and who we want to be and how we want to serve the people we care for. So I think by really focusing on what your purpose is and how you cultivate that, that is, I think, one of the strongest ways to identify and work through wellness. Hey, Back Table listeners, this is Aaron Fritz. Before we move on with the episode, I want to tell you about a new show coming out on the Back Table Network this December. It's the Back Table Innovation Show, where hosts Brian Hartley, Eric Gantwerger, and myself will be bringing you stories from physician innovators and med tech founders who are helping to shape medicine through health tech. We received so much great feedback from the innovation series over the last year with episodes like the origin story of the Palma stent with Julio Palmez and starting a med tech company with Mahmoud Razavi that we decided to make a whole show dedicated to showcasing the vibrant entrepreneurial spirit of these individuals and hopefully inspire others. Keep an eye out for it wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. And be sure to follow the new show at underscore backtable INN on Twitter and Instagram for the latest. A trend that I see in my specialty, which I, I personally feel like helps is contributing to burnout and this feeling of stress with, with our, our, our jobs is, is FOMO, to be honest. You know, uh, social media, people are posting how great their, their career, their, uh, jobs are like all these cool cases they are doing. And then you start looking at yourself, you're like, well, man, I didn't do a cool case like that this week. You know, I did, I, what am I doing? Like, I, I need to get a better job. Right? I just feel like there's, there's this element of, of missing out that is, um, largely due to social media. Social media obviously has its upsides, but it's also, it's, it's not that different from the teenage girl looking at the, the beautiful women on, on Instagram you kind of get this insecurity by seeing what other people are doing. And a lot of times those, pe those people aren't really, their jobs aren't really that great. They're just presenting themselves that way. Do you, have, do you have any insight on that? Or is that something you touch on with Operate With Zen? Yeah, we definitely touch on it. And it is definitely one of the challenges. And it's not just in academic medicine. I think you see this in clinical medicine as well too, right? Oh yeah. man, my partner's doing better cases than I am. I'd like to have a better case mix. In academics, you worry about being scooped, right? Oh man, those people are, they're, they're published on, on something that I'm publishing on and they're getting out ahead of me and they have more notoriety. And 
I think a lot of it is framework and perception. And I definitely struggled with that early in my career. And I think one of the things that helped me kind of work through that is taking joy in the successes of others. And that can be clinically. So you see your partners and you go, gosh, you know what? Aditya does an unbelievable retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And it makes me really happy to see him do one so well and to see that patient do well, even though I know there's a component of me that really would have loved to do that operation and thinks I could have done a great job too, right? But you have to take joy in your, in your partner's successes. And academically, you have to take joy in people furthering the field, whether you're involved or not. So as I think you guys know, you know, I do a lot of work in small renal masses and active surveillance and, and watching tumors and non-operative management. And early on in my career, I felt very, very protective of that space, right? I had to be the one publishing in it. Our work had to be pushed forward. And I will tell you, some of that is just maturation, but I am so happy when anyone in the world now is publishing on that topic because it's furthering the field. Whether they agree with what I've said, whether they're challenging what I've said, whether they're writing something contrary or better than I've written, it just makes me happy that we're moving the field forward. As I said, some of that's maturity, some of that's perspective, but if we, you know, you can't necessarily change the circumstances you're, you're put in, but you can certainly change the way you view them. And that's not an original thought um, that, you know, the, the best example of that is Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meeting, which is, I, I would recommend for a reading for anyone, no matter what your profession is, what you do in life, it is one of the most profound and relatively short reads you will ever have. But that is one of the major take-homes is you can't change your circumstances, but you certainly can change the way you view them. Yeah, that's solid advice. Appreciate that. It is a great book. I, I think it's been about 10 years since I've read it, then it might be time for a, you know, another, another crack at it. And, and I can absolutely hear what you're saying. I feel like somehow in life in general and in medicine, in a blink of an eye, you're not like the junior guy, you're not the young guy. Now you're like the mid-career guy. And certainly in a blink of an eye, it's going to be, you know, you're the senior guy, but having like trained fellows for five years or residents and you see the amazing things that they're doing. And, um, it really is super rewarding. And I think it's again, quite insightful for me just to say, you know, it is, it doesn't have to be me at the epicenter. And I think some of this goes into ego, which is, let's be honest, a part and part of academic medicine, it's bandwidth, it's resources, it's being you know, knowing internally that you're doing your best and feeling content with that and, and having it be, I think, more absolute than relative or relational. That I, I've done this and this might be small at my institution and this may be incremental in the big scheme of things, but it was good and it was helpful and I feel happy about it. I think that's also something that, you know, it's hard to realize because if, if it's going to be comparative, it's keeping up with the Joneses. And that's always going to be unsatisfying. Oh, for sure. And, you know, we're all type A personalities, right? We're all like gunners and, and it's part of being competitive is almost hard, hardwired into us to get to where we are. So that's going to take like some real, you know, reflection to like, to recognize it and say, no, I need to take a step back and realize how great I am. And I don't need to keep up with Aditya, you know, crush it over there at UCSD. So I, I, I think it's solid advice and it's, it's something that it's probably a linchpin to, to what we want to achieve in terms of wellness. Yeah. It, it's great points. And you bring up the competitive spirit, right? You're right. We all have competitive spirit. And once again, it's about framing that, that competitive spirit. And we, you could put it all into your individual efforts and your individual successes. Um, and there are certainly people who do that, but you could also put that competitive energy into your institutional or departmental or divisional or practice group or whatever it may be into that competitive edge for that group. And the other part of that competitive edge or energy is using it in a positive direction. You could certainly use that competitive energy to take down competitors or colleagues or even your, the, the people you work with. But if you're using that energy to kind of build and promote other people, you see things come back and all of a sudden everybody's moving in the right direction and, and the kind of the synergy is much better than you could ever do as an individual. The really good analogy for kind of using that energy wisely are Olympic athletes. And you'll see kind of before, you know, just like 
we get nervous before we do a case sometimes, or we have anxious energy or anxieties. Before they're in a competition, they have that same energy. And there's actually a whole performance science behind this, but the most successful Olympic athletes take that energy and channel it into the competition rather than wasting it on what we would kind of colloquially call nerves or, or non-productive uses of that energy. It's taking that energy and using it in the right direction rather than letting it just expand into space. So one of the things that I think might be challenging is doing this alone, that we feel like, you know, we need to create a life that's conducive to wellness by ourselves. And of course there's family support. I think it might be oftentimes difficult for people to talk to a partner, a colleague, a chairman, a chairwoman, you know, that, Hey, I think I'm having some issues or problems here. And, uh, there's been, I think, increasing recognition that engaging a coach, engaging other people that have expertise in this can be beneficial. I was curious if you have any thoughts or opinions on that, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. So it is much easier to be well in a culture of wellness. So building a culture of wellness is challenging, but there are certainly things you can do. And I think that's one of the reasons I started the podcast was to try and build a culture that it's okay to talk about these things, first of all, right? Especially in surgery, there's a stigma that you should be tough. And, you know, for lack of a better term, we should be that, that classic masculine form, whether you're a, a woman or a man, right? But you should be stoic and you should not wear your emotions on your sleeve. But I think that that's wrong. We should be talking about these things. These are important components of who we are and how we interact with each other. So the first thing is, you're right, you need to speak to other people around it. And if you don't have people in your institution, then there are certainly people around the country and around the world who would be willing to, to speak to you. I'm willing to talk to anybody who, who hears this and, and feels like they're, they're struggling and there are definitely uh, other professionals out there who can do that. I would say in most institutions, depending on the size of them now, the administration realizes the importance of this. The costs of burnout and losing a physician or a surgeon and recruiting somebody else have brought this to the forefront. And so they are very aware and most large institutions now will have at least wellness initiatives or a wellness officer or some program where you can reach out and you can seek help if you need it. And the last little point I'll make is if you are really struggling um, by yourself or you don't feel like you're in a culture of wellness, to foster that as an individual, one of the easiest things you can sometimes do is journal or write. And we, you know, we like to think that you can just reflect in your head um, and you can, but there are certain, there are certain benefits to putting things down and things you can journal about. I, I journal every day. You may be surprised to hear that, Aditya, but I, I journal every day now. Um, and there's three components to my journaling. The first is gratitude. I write at least one thing that I'm grateful for in that day. The second thing I do is I write down only one to three things that I have to do the next day, right? So it helps me prioritize and lower anxieties about the next day. What has to be done? What are the real priorities? Because everything else can get done. And then the third thing is an opportunity just to reflect on things that happened in the day, things that went well, things that went poorly, things I want to help cement in my mind. And just kind of that act helps me reflect on that. And so if you're out there and you feel like you're alone or an individual or you want to cultivate this, Try, try journaling. You could do it on paper. You could do it on a computer. You can start your own blog or podcast just to kind of put these things down. There's lots of ways to do this, but getting the, the words out or down, I think sometimes really helps. I think it's wonderful. I wholeheartedly think it's, it's a very mature and responsible thing to do. You know, last, last year in the midst of the pandemic, my wife and I took a art of living mindfulness co uh, course on breathing and reflection and it was a game changer. And, um, you know, I, I engage in breathing exercises daily. You know, it, it's not always a full half an hour, but it's something I prioritize. And certainly I, I would say that, you know, the days that I can actually spend three minutes thinking about what I want to do today versus where I just come in and start email checking and in basketing. And next thing I know, I'm, you know, down 55 rabbit holes and I have no sense of accomplishment it's a hundred percent different day. So I think it's, it's really sound advice and to spend that time to get grounded, to think about what the next little bit looks like is, is incredibly valuable. And 
you know, in my experience, um, I, th- I think you're right. There's wellness initiatives. There's a lot of things that are that are coming from institutional levels. And certainly, you know, when something catastrophic happens, I, you know, there was a, a suicide from a urology resident earlier this year, which is heartbreaking or alcohol and drug abuse. And, and we have these employment assistant programs and we have, to me, it's always seemed like a bit removed. I mean, the likelihood of me like tracking down and calling like an 800 number to say, hey, you know, I had a tough day today and you want to talk about it would be tough. But I have done a decent job about identifying friends, colleagues, mentors. Early on, I mean, especially after a complication, I would shut down for like six months. And I would remind myself before I walk inside my house, like, hey, my kids, they don't get it. They need you to be there and they want you to be positive. And I want it to, but it's, it's really hard. And um, clearly in our profession, things happen if you're doing big cancer cases or, you know, big procedures that, that happens or, or any number of things. It could be that you missed an in-basket result on somebody's potassium and who knows. But once I like felt that there were people that knew that I was competent, that my heart was in the right pit place and I could like talk to them fairly openly, it, it made it okay. And um, I think all of us recognize that the highs are high and they're fleeting. And the lows are ultra lows and they're, they're long lasting. So you know, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, you know, whether it's a formal mentor, a leadership coach, a friend, and I tell all the graduating fellows and chiefs this, like you got to find somebody that you can talk to about, about the lows, because if they fester, if they get internalized, the feelings that come along with that are, they can really put you in a dark spot for a hot minute. Yeah. Ditcha, thanks for sharing that. Uh, You know, I think that's one of the most important things is recognizing that we all go through these incredibly tough times and these incredible lows. I forget the the surgeon who said it, but there's a classic quote that all surgeons carry around with them a a cemetery or a graveyard of things that have not gone well. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, people died, but, but we've all had things where they don't go well. And those are the things we remember on a daily basis, much more so than all of the successes we've, we've had. And you're absolutely right. You need lots of mentors. And when I talk to people now about getting mentors, right, especially in academic medicine, we talk about, right, you want your academic mentor, you want your clinical mentor. And that may be somebody you can go to for, you know, to talk about complications or issues in your clinical practice. But I also tell people now that you want a a wellness mentor. You want somebody that you can go to and talk about life. And I think we all kind of identify those through our training, right? There's always, you know, I went through some really tough times in residency and then there was, you know, one of the docs at Hopkins that I could just kind of go to and, and unload about life things to. And, and he was always there uh, as a, as a voice. And I think I didn't recognize that as an objective relationship then, but I think a wellness mentor is in part of that kind of mentorship portfolio that we need to develop as we move forward. If you're having trouble finding that near where you are, there are coaches and there are things out there. Part of my journey over the last two years, I got certified as a coach. And, you know, coaching is a completely different topic and, um, you know, a much longer conversation. But long story short, coaching has been around forever in business, decades. It's been around in medicine for about 10 years, but it's in the C-suites, right? The deans and the, and the CEOs and our chair people get coaching and people who need remediation get in coaching. But we potentially have the biggest, in my opinion, have the biggest impact to coach for junior level surgeons. I think that's where you and I would have benefited from it most, right? When we were really struggling as juniors and we've come a long way and we've developed and we may have successfully navigated some of those issues, but a coach would have been tremendously helpful. So even though I was trained as kind of a leadership coach, I consider it more of a developmental coach. My focus is, is more on junior people and helping them through those struggles. And, you know, I, I think you'll find other people out there, whether they're formally coaches or not, who can help you through that process. Yeah, I I had the opportunity of doing kind of a leadership program in Dallas and it was, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes I found it easier to reflect, share, almost be more honest with like a total stranger that didn't know me from the other person. And it was ultimately a, a super interesting, insightful and valuable experience. And then, I mean, of course, there's the the value in talking to somebody that knows you and is you know, it's hard to, hard to surpass, but I, I do think that it, it was, and I'd never, I'm not the type of person that would have ever sought out, like, let me track down a coach and chat with them a couple of times, but it was, it was actually, um, a fun and, um, insightful experience. Yeah. I'll just tell you, I mean, one of my best coaches and mentors 
is somebody in medicine who's not a doctor, who's at a completely mm. different institution, right. who is just, they've seen it all and they can just sit there. And, and my philosophy on coaching and a lot of good coaches, they're not going to give you the answer. The answer is within you. They just help you bring it out, right? That's what a good coach does. They help bring the talent out from their players. And in medicine or, you know, surgery, the good coach will help bring that talent out of you or help you get to the answers without necessarily giving them to you. We'll go back to the parallel with the business world. A lot of executives have coaches and have had coaches their whole executive careers. And it's kind of goofy that we don't do that as physicians and have formal programs where people have access to a coach, at least if they want one, you know? I mean, this certainly is an original, is not an original thought, but your Tiger Woods, your Michael Jordan, yeah. your Roger Federer, you know, people, yeah. everybody gets coached all the time. And to think that you know, we're coached through residency or fellowship. And then it's like, now you're off, um, practically in terms of, you know, making sure that you're operating at the st state of the art, et cetera. I mean, not to mention the holistic 360 degree approach to it. I, I would totally agree that, you know, without some constant mentorship, almost, um, you know, mandatory that, uh, where we're really losing out, um, for ourselves and likely for our patients as well. And you're absolutely right. The Michael Jordans and the Tiger Woods and the elite of the e elite use coaches. But if you look at the NBA and the NFL, they've got it right too. rookie camps, rookie coaches, right? They sit those guys down and they say, okay, here's, here's help on how to behave. Here's help on how to control your finances. You know, they recognize the importance of kind of the impactful presence you can have in somebody's early, early career. And I think we could do a better job of that in medicine too. You know, I recently saw a movie or it was kind of a documentary called The Weight of Gold. It's HBO and it's uh, narrated by Michael Phelps and it, and it kind of runs through, you know, interviews with all these elite Olympic athletes. And suffice it to say that a lot of them struggle with mental health, with personal health, with financial health. And, um, you know, I think things kind of came to a head a couple of years ago when a couple of, you know, externally very successful, positive people committed suicide. And, you know, of course, there's similarities, there's differences, there's parallels, but, um, each Olympic athlete does get a, uh, psychologist, which is at least a step in the right direction. And clearly there's a, a lot of work to be done, but you know, one-on-one -on -one, just recognizing that part and parcel of our profession can be high stress, managing that, and then managing that in the context of, I want to be a well-rounded, happy person. It's not easy. And I feel like we're generally people that have been able to get where we're going on our own merit. I'm going to get the job done up until now. And, and to step back, reassess that is also not easy, but I also think it's never too late to do that. And, and to maybe, you know, whether it's reset or recalibrate is not easy. And, and this actually kind of brings me in, I think you're a perfect example. You know, you've been doing this for enough time to have perspective. You're not, uh, you know, kind of put out to pasture by any stretch of the imagination. And you're like, you know what, I, I recognize this and I want to do something about it. And so with that, tell us a little bit about, um, operating with Zen. And in my opinion, that can give a little bit more in depth diving into some of the aspects of wellness, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about your podcast as, as we, you know, kind of wrap up. Yeah. So you bring a great point. To, but before I get to the podcast, just about kind of mindfulness and intention, you don't have to meditate to be mindful. And just like we, we had that kind of conversation about emails and how you manage your day, right? If you're thoughtful about your day and how you're going to attack your office or your clinic, whatever it's going to be, it goes easier. It's a little more productive rather than just kind of floating through the day. All of a sudden you look halfway through and you've, you've missed out on a lot. Mindfulness is being thoughtful. And if you're thoughtful and intentional at how you approach surgery and your life and your family, you can get a lot more out of it just by pushing it a little bit in a direction. You don't have to fully dive into this. And I think that's part of the point of Operate with Zen. And it's in evolution. The first season uh, was released over the summer in July. And it was a fair amount of monologues, as I said, me kind of putting down thoughts and frameworks of mindfulness in surgery. And using kind of classic concepts of mindfulness and self and how to kind of put those forward, time and space management, cultivating the self, cultivating purpose. And some interviews with people I knew were kind of mindful 
in urology and in surgery. And season two will release soon and it's much more interviews. And that's the feedback we got. People wanna hear from other providers, how they are or are not mindful, how they get through their days, their weeks, how they plan out vacations. And the idea is to give people, first of all, a forum to talk about these things and think about them and say, it's okay to talk about these things in surgery, but then also provide some practical skills and practical knowledge on how you can be mindful in your own life. And I would say, it, once again, it's highly personal. Yeah, I'm, I do meditate every day, not well, but even the Dalai Lama would say he doesn't meditate well on a daily basis, right? But we try and that's part of it and, and we're intentional about it, but that may not work for somebody else. And so we try and build the framework where people can talk about these things, work on themselves. And in season two, it's really diverse. Angie Smith from North Carolina is gonna talk, is talking about vacations and how you manage your vacation, really practical skills. Karen Schwartz, who's a wonderful psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, is talking about physician suicide and why we're seeing so much of this, you know, through COVID and beyond and burnout. Dr. Walsh is going to get on there and talk about purpose and life and, you know, kind of how you define your purpose in medicine. So really diverse people, really diverse topics, but all centered around being a better surgeon, a better physician and creating a culture where it's okay to talk about these things. That's incredible, man. It's going to be a great resource. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to season two. So that sounds like some great guests. Well, you know, I, I certainly have been able to take away a lot of things to, to reflect on and I need to make sure that, uh, you know, I just don't go hurtling through life at, at a million miles an hour. It, it was, uh, a blessing in a lot of ways, you know, as hard as it was to leave a place that I love to sit back and, um, recalibrate personally, emotionally, professionally. And, um, we have one shot at it. We have one life. And I think we all want it to be something that resembles what we had envisioned. So, you know, really thanks to Phil for, for being somebody who's a leader in our field, who can step back and say, these are things that are important. I think you really have a foot on both sides of it as, as a person that's been doing this for a while. And as, as a person that can relate to younger people, millennials, and, uh, I would encourage junior people, senior people across the spectrum to, to sit back, reflect and, and do these things that, that do promote wellness. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you both. Aaron, thanks for bringing us together. Ditch, it's always great to talk with you and, and I wish you the best of luck in San Diego. It's, it's, uh, you know, interesting. We've spent uh, some good time together over the last years and, and we're a little bit further apart now than we used to be, but, uh, we'll still meet up. Both great places to visit for both of you guys, you know, Philly and San Diego. Well, thanks, Phil. Appreciate it, man. And uh, looking forward to getting this one out on both our endovascular show as well as the urology show. Uh, another, you know, w just another cross collaborative episode where we all benefit. Um, and uh, looking forward to additional episodes we have you coming up talking about small renal masses, uh, right? Management of small renal masses here shortly. So looking forward to that one. Thanks, guys. Awesome being here.